Welcome to America's Horse on America's Trail with the Mustang Discovery Ride. I'm your host, Julianne Neal. Over the next 12 months, we'll be following tip trainers Hannah Catalino and Lisanne Fear, along with Abilene, Bagheera, Chili, Cody, Finn, and Rosette, and of course, Fira and Caillou, as they cross the American Discovery Trail on a quest to bring attention to the plight of America's Mustangs. With a goal of 5,000 miles, 5,000 Mustangs, the Mustang Discovery Ride team hopes to bring attention to adoption into appropriate homes for these living legends. We hope that you'll join Hannah and Lisanne on this journey of a lifetime by following the Mustang Discovery Ride podcast. Enjoy the ride. In this episode, we'll sit down for a conversation with Felipe Lete, long rider, author, journalist, and filmmaker. Well, I I have to ask also, we've talked even over the past couple of podcasts, we've talked a lot about family and um, Hannah had the chance to see family over the holidays. And I've talked to Lisanne some about her family too. And so Felipe, you had the opportunity, as you said earlier, your dad was such a huge influence on you early on. He joined up with you on part of your ride and I think rode over a thousand miles. So now he's a long rider too. So what was that? What What did that mean to you to have him along with you? Oh, it was, uh, it was both pleasing and painful. <laughs> um, I, to, to be able to live this, uh, this dream next to my old man, who ultimately, like, I inherited this dream from him, was just, like, unbelievable. Like, it's stuff for movies, you know? Like, who gets to share a can of beans in the middle of the Chihuahua Desert with your old man, and you got two must- one Mustang, and two quarter horses in a makeshift corral uh, while you're hoping no one kills you. <laughs> Seven days to get to the first town, you know, like it was unbelievable. Like, but at the same time, you know, like I think that um, because uh, we young men are very similar to our fathers, we have a complicated relationship with them, right? And, and I talk about in the documentary how it was so funny, like we got into this tempestuous fight in the middle of like, northern mexico because i don't remember who said what but like one guy said that palomino was a breed the other guy was like no it's not a breed anywhere in the world it's just a horse color and like we didn't talk all day like one guy way ahead the other one way behind um so that was funny just you know those kind of moments you're you're not only living with your father but you're suffering you're pitching tents you're you know, riding to one in the morning looking for water. So it's a very intense experience. But yeah, I just feel so blessed to to have him accompany me for three months. He's a long rider as well, which was a dream of his to be a part of the Long Riders Guild. And uh, he's he's very proud of it. And I think ultimately it brought us closer together, uh, being out there and sharing that experience. Oh God, I'm sure it did. And you mentioned water. That was another thing that struck me when I was reading or I saw your pilot from years and years ago when you were talking about the yeah. going through a drought. I mean, we've been talking with the girls about the, the weather that they've hit. Tell me about, I mean, water is so crucial every, every day. What it, was that like driving you crazy? I wouldn't have been able to, co- to concentrate because of that. So yeah, talk to yeah. about that situation. Uh, water is life. And uh, when you go on a long ride, um, nothing is more evident. And also, uh, nothing impacts you more than the weather. You're outdoor, outdoors all day, especially uh, when you you don't have a support vehicle and you're you know you're by yourself. You it's you, the horses, and the elements. If it's snowing, you're cold. If it's hot, you're dripping in sweat, and your lips are all cut up. And if it's windy, you want to shoot someone. And when the wind stops, the bugs come out, and then you also want to shoot someone. And it's. Uh, it was very hard to find water. People always like ask me, what did you do for feed? How did you feed them? And obviously I couldn't carry feed in that first ride because it was too heavy. You can't pack, you know, a bag of feed or a bale of hay. So we ate what we found, but even in the desert, although there wasn't a lot of grass, there was still something for the horses to eat. And sometimes that little uh, grass we found in in the desert was so strong and full of nutrients. It was enough to keep the horses healthy. And then, you know, if I saw them losing weight, I'd stop in a town for a week and and feed them and find alfalfa. But water, uh, you can't do anything about it. You can't carry it and you need it every day. And horses drink 
so much water. And that's what, you know, was the hardest part of the trip. I now understand that, glo you know, global warming is real. I don't know what's influenced seeing it obviously but there is a change in weather, weather patterns all over the world every country i cross it was the worst drought in, in, in the last generation it was the hottest summer in the past 100 years um i was riding by dry creeks and and that anxiety that you have you know all day thinking am i going to find water for these animals as you trek um nearly drove me mad and that's why my second and third long ride i always had someone else with me i had a support vehicle because it just, it was going to drive me crazy. You know what I mean? I've met long riders um, that you look into their eyes and they weren't all there because, you know, it's the perfect recipe for, I was just calling you there. Um, it's the perfect recipe. For, uh, and they're trying again. <laughs> Sorry. It's the perfect recipe for insanity. So I really, uh, it's something I value a lot is I think we need to take care of our bodies, our spirits, but also our mental health. And uh, like I said, I just, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. No I'm problem. So sorry. Some people are just very yeah. persistent. <laughs> um, but yeah, water was a very big problem was finding water. There were days where I'd tie up the horse with no water and just pray that, um, that they wouldn't call it. Bernice Andy, uh, the greatest long rider I've ever met, had the honor to meet. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away last year. And uh, I met her before my long ride uh, for a day uh, while she was riding around Canada, right before I went to Stan Walchuk's clinic. And uh, she gave me an arsenal of, of tricks and knowledge that I learned from her. But one of the biggest things she taught me was to carry cooking oil in the pack saddle. And if you have no water, you fill a syringe with it and you dump it down the horse's throats and you hope that they don't call like that helps, uh, you know, to lubricate their very, very long intestines. And uh, that's what I would do. And then the next day, get up early and keep riding and, and try to find water again. But yeah, by far the hardest thing, what impacted me the most, what almost drove me crazy with anxiety uh, was trying to find water. Mm. Well, I know Hannah and Lisanne, you guys met Bernice um, before she passed also, and, and she was instrumental in some of the things that y'all have talked about. Tell me a little bit more about meeting her and what that meant to you, Lisanne. Yeah, it was crazy. So I don't know how it exactly happened. It was really incredible. Um, so one of her, sorry, one of her sponsors was uh, Outfitter Supply and we really wanted to get um, with Outfitter Supply. So I was living at Hannah's place at the time up there in Montana. So I just drove up farther north Montana and I got to meet Russ Barnett, the owner of Outfitter Supply up there. And, you know, like I'm kind of just like a blonde girl and I walk in there and like Russ doesn't really take me serious about anything, but I end up sitting there and talking to him for three hours about like packing and guiding in the mountains of Wyoming. And he finally like started taking me a little bit more serious about life. And I told him how it was kind of like a dream of mine, but meet Bernice and Hannah had been trying to get a hold of her for like five or six months. And we had gotten like one email, one, one off time from her. So like, she was very hard to pin down. And after I finally broke those walls with Russ, a little bit of trust and like respect, uh, he was like, well, I'll try to get, get a hold of her for you. And he tried three different numbers that he had for her. And one like went to a, a publisher, one went to like her accountant and I think like the third line was like disconnected. So he was like, I'm so sorry, but I really like tried to get a hold of her for you. And I was like, oh, that's okay. And so I end up leaving and I get 20 minutes back down the road headed south. And he calls me and he's like, you'll never guess who I'm sitting across from right now. And I was like, no way. And Bernice had just stopped by just like half an hour after I had left. And uh, he was like, she'll be at the fairgrounds at five o'clock. And I was like, all right, I will be at the fairgrounds at five o'clock. And it was just so, so incredible, like how, how the universe works in that way. And um, to be able to sit there, cause I just sat with her in the grass. She had like made herself a camp. She had her truck and trailer at the time. Cause she was moving down South uh, to live with her sister. And she was like, I'm not used to having all of this she points at her trailer and she just has like a tarp tied to it across oh. to like make a little bit more of a shelter but um you know she was having a lot of health problems at the time but she just sat with so much grace and poise in the grass that like 
it was just so incredible to see like just how remarkable she was and um, she gave us a lot of advice on several different things as well. Um, one of the biggest things was like being like team, like team cohesion, uh, as far as like your horses together, like they have to move as a unit when you need them to move. And that one really stuck with us. And I'm also running Borium on my shoes too, like, like she had suggested different things. And so, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was really incredible to sit across from her. And then I got to meet again it's just so crazy how it all happened but I got to meet her little fjords uh she had Essie Pearl there in Montana spirit and it was so cool to sit there and meet them but she literally like just like hopped up on a bareback and she's going through all these health things and she's so tiny and like frail and fragile and she just hopped up there like she had done you know thousands of times before and literally rode off into the sunset like I have like this nice photo of like her sitting astride and like the sun setting in the background but I mean, yeah, I mean, she, she is a legend for sure. And in my interaction and encounter with her is definitely like legendary for sure. So very, very fortunate to have had the chance to meet her before she passed. Well, it sounds to me like having those people who inspire you and having mentors and everything is, is an incredible part of being a long rider is, is what it sounds like to me. And so Felipe, since you've been through all of this, I'm going to challenge Hannah and Lisanne. What, what would you ask him that, that he could give you as a piece of advice? I, the whole thing with the, the um, vegetable oil, I never even thought about that. That's, that's an incredible thing that you could do. But what's something else that you could ask Felipe um, as, as a little piece, a little tidbit piece of advice for the trip? I don't know. A burning question I've had is... Uh... Yeah, when we first started out, we had no goal or like no plan of having three animals. And I, in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, the only one I know that had three animals is like, and he was like crazy because I'm like with just one pony animal. And I'm like, you know, initially I, it was kind of a struggle to be like, you know, trying to get your horse to go forward, but then also worry about your pony animal. And then somehow we have three animals and we're doing it yeah each and it's working out fine but I'm just kind of curious as like like how you know your learning curve was with that and like I for me it depends on the animal like which one sometimes I have both my pony animals in one hand and and my ridden animal in another hand or you know other animals sometimes do better when when I have uh the pony animal and a ridden horse in the one hand and then I just have you know, one of the pony animals in, in a free hand. And I was just curious, like, I'm, I'm a Liberty trainer. So I use a lot of like no ropes. <laughs> so now having to learn how to manage and juggle all these ropes, I'm just curious if you had any uh, tips or tricks or, or what did you, en- what you ended up doing? Oh, uh, it's a, uh, it's a mess, right? Cause it's like, it's, it's like taking children, right? They all, they want to do what they're not supposed to all the time, right? One <laughs> wants to stop to eat. The other one wants to kick it. The other one wants to run forward. And uh, yeah, it's very hard. Did, have you watched Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell? I don't know if you've seen that movie, no. but there's a, it's, it's funny. And he, he does this thing where he's like, when he's interviewed, he doesn't know what to do with his hands. So he always just like, he's, he's getting interviewed by like ESPN or whatnot. And he just starts to like raise his hand in the middle of the interview. And it's like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. And literally that's how I feel when I ride horses now. And all I got to do is hold the reins and like, what do I do with my hand? Like, what does this hand do? Like, cause usually you're like, you know, controlling one horse, the other one's over here. Now the lead's under the tail. And uh, for me, the safest way, although it was super annoying and, and at first it's hard to get used to was to hold uh, the leads because one time I almost got in a terrible wreck when one horse almost went over the edge of a trail. And now it was going to take me as well because he was tied to the tail. So after that, I was like, never tying anyone to anybody ever again. If I lose one animal, at least I lose one animal, not three or two. Uh, so I always just took one lead rope in one hand, the other lead rope with the reins in the left hand. But it was a constant, just stop. What are you doing? No, we're not going to eat right now. No, you're not going to chop board. And yeah, you just get used to it eventually. But yeah, it's a, it's a learning curve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. What were you, what were you mostly using to like navigate on the road? So like I have my phone and I like download maps yeah. all all the time but yeah exactly i oh, use but... maps it was a mixture of like the phone i never had uh, as you know we never have signal as soon as you get out of a town right like yeah so you're like oh we're, we're good at this phone now throw it out so i would download maps as well when i remembered but 
I'd have uh, real maps um, of the regions I was going through. I always tried to buy uh, different kind of maps and uh, the people, you know, as you, I'm sure you found out, uh, yeah. the people along the way, you know, a lot of elderly folks drawing maps on the dirt. And when you see the old cow in the past, you're on your right, you turn left, you get there, there's like a hundred cows. It's like, oh, perfect. Uh, but that was a lot of that, you know what I mean? A lot of just the local people uh leading me because no one knows the region you're traveling to i'm sure you found out and the people that live there right and it's it's super hard to know the best grazing spots and where there's going to be water for horses when you're looking at a map uh, even you know i did a lot of google map looking in uh through the the satellite and stuff but yeah the, the local people would ultimately divert me and send me down the best routes Ooh. yeah i think another question that hannah and i both kind of had is uh very briefly in mexico it sounded like you were traveling with a donkey what was yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well what was that like traveling with a donkey because we've been traveling with one for a little bit now too <laughs> it's crazy it's like having a dog like they're just so funny you know he was the comic relief of the group he was super strong uh, we got him because when my dad came, we were now uh, utilizing all the animals, right? All the animals had weight on their backs, as I'm sure you found out. Uh, you know, it's not easy to have something on top of their backs for eight, 10 hours a day. You need to have the right saddle pads. You need to have everything uh, weighed properly. And even still, you're going to get chafing. You're going to get, you know, hair being rubbed. And that's what slows us down more than anything because it's, you know, three seconds for a saddle sore to emerge and it's a month or more for it to go away um so we were having that with uh you know due to frenchy there was some chafing in the back uh from the pack saddle and uh so we're like okay we need another animal to to do the rotation that i was able to do when it was myself and the three horses and yeah he was just uh he was gonna go to slaughter this little donkey and we bought him um and uh he carried the pack for us and he was just so strong and he um he hated the horses and the horses hated him dude wanted to kill him at any uh opportunity possible but he just like every time we came with alfalfa in the morning to feed them when we had it he would just be yelling you know wagging his tail and you know we just like pet him like a dog it was an amazing experience to have him out we loved having little little general cuenca male out there with us That's did you also have how has it been how has it, how has it been for you girls with yours Oh yeah, he's really <laughs> lovely. Like he kind of the same thing. Like he's kind of scared of the horses, but it's perfect because I ride. So I have a mare uh, with me, and she hates the boys touching her. So like the donkey doesn't touch her. <laughs> so like that that team part of the team gets goes well. But then like if the burrow mm -hmm. ever gets fast, she's like, "How dare you pass me?" And so it is like squabbling siblings like all day. Uh, and, yeah. You know, so you know, but I mean, I feel like you know we're a few like several hundred miles into our journey and things are finally you know they're starting to figure each other out I mean the problem I'm mostly having with him is that he is a lot slower than the horses and you know that does pull uh pull on my horses a little bit and and that's where you know we're considering leaving him behind for a little bit just to make some make up some miles but uh it is so hard because they they do bring so much personality and and he's such a great ambassador because there are 15,000 burrows that need homes as well. You know, we're riding for the Mustangs, but in that category that goes on set is the burrows and, and they are such wonderful animals. Uh, so, you know, it'll be really hard to, to have him, you know, be on the sideline for a little bit, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoy having him and they're such lovely little creatures. So I've been in the Mustangs 10 years and only the burrows for three, but I'm like, where have they been my whole life? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. They have a huge personality. Today. I love them. Yeah, just so cuddly and lovely. Hey, I'm Rhonda Gregorio. I'm one of the many photographers and videographers with the Mustang Discovery Ride. I'm enjoying some amazing BLK water this morning. It's my first time trying it, and it is absolutely delicious. You should get some. And I echo that. I'm Diana DeRosa. I'm also here doing photography and videography and trying BLK for the first time. And I love it. It's got all different flavors and it's good for you and organic right up my alley. Get yours today. Balance, love, kindness, black water, clear benefits.
Well, Felipe, as you crossed through on your trip, you went through different countries. And so to me, it's a little bit like the girls going through all these different states. And they're only through the third state now, about to cross into the fourth one. So, you know, the halfway mark is not so far away. Is there any advice you can give them as far as when you started reaching that halfway point? Was there ever any thought in your mind, first of all, of turning back? And if, if so, what, what advice would you give the girls about that or about anything else that you came across? Uh, turning back from day one, like the day I left the Calgary Stampede, I was like, what am I doing? Like, this is insanity. I'm going to die. Like, <laughs> I can't even get out of this city. How the hell am I going to get to Mexico alive? Um, so, yeah, but you can't because the horses are the glue and you just you can't leave your horses up and live, leave them on the side of the road or in the middle of Guatemala. So, um, yeah, I thought about quitting every day, to be honest with you, but I couldn't quit because. I'm a cowboy and because the horses were always the glue that kept it, you know, you just kept keep going. You got to get them home. Uh, but to me, what I would say to them, that it was a huge learning uh, curve for me during my first journey. And I wish someone had told me and maybe they did, but I didn't listen to them. because I was young and stupid. Um, it's to enjoy every second of it. You know, I always had this anxiety in me to get to the next country, to get to the next state, because those imaginary lines give you a lot of power, right? Like, oh, okay you're one state closer, you're one country closer, you're, you know, now, okay, after one year, I was in Southern Mexico, I still had a year left, but okay, I, I'm in Southern Mexico, like, you look at the map, you're like, look how much I've traveled, so those moments, they give you a great deal of power to continue, but at the same time, you can't just have that in your mind all the time, because it doesn't allow you to enjoy, like I said, the moment where one of your horses may be injured and you're at this small little village for a month that no one else is going to get to spend time at. And all of a sudden you're adopted by this amazing family and you know, you're hugging the kids and you're learning about how they play their traditional game of, you know, putting a little tiny lance through a ring on horseback. And, and those were the really special moments for me and, and the people I met. And, and it always happened when I wasn't expecting it. And when I was laid over and when I was, kind of angry because I wanted to get to the next stage because I wanted to get to that next imaginary line, that next check on the long list of goals. So that's it. Just enjoy it. You know, it's going to go by super quick. Although right now it may not seem like it, it's going to go by super quick. And when you step down from that saddle in the years to come, um, you're always going to remember this ride and this moment and wish that, you know, you were there again with your Mustangs and that's all you're worried about was saddle sores and rain and, and weather and now you got to worry about bills and the price of oil and and everything else so yeah just really enjoy it take it in you know every second realize how lucky you are to be with these animals and and very few people get to do this and see the world um at three four kilometers an hour um it's such a special way to see the world and again very few people get that opportunity so make sure you enjoy every second yeah i think one of our questions was I mean, we definitely don't know really what we're doing after this long ride and like hearing what you went through, like that sounds really rough, um, but you went ahead and did a few more long rides. Do you have anything else in the works? I mean, you only ended your last one like a year or so ago. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I think that's uh, never say never, but for right now, uh, I wouldn't do another long ride, you know, like I'm not a cat. I don't know how many lives I have, but I definitely <laughs> use most of them. Like, it's, this isn't a video game. Like, I can't just hop up and get another life. Like, at some point, you know, it's going to end. And, uh, and like, my family, you know, my mom, like, the wear and tear I've had emotionally on her. Like, I would be in Mexico for days without, with no contact while she's reading news headlines of people getting decapitated by the Zetas, you know? Like, so it, it's been really hard on my entire family and on myself, like I said, mentally um, as well. So, as of right now, I, I want to uh, focus on my journalism. I'm getting the documentary out. Uh, we're going to premiere it uh, February 25th in uh, South Carolina, the Buford International Film Festival. And then this entire year, it's about uh, pushing that and uh, getting that documentary out. I've been working on it for freaking almost 12 years now. So it's like, I can't wait to, to you know, just see what people are going to say, whether they throw tomatoes at me or they love it. I'm just excited to, to get it out. And and then I'd like to, uh, I'm working on a new um, reality series where I want to uh, show culture through the horse all over the world. Uh, so, you know, go to different countries and, and, and show the culture of the people 
through these uh, equestrian events and, and these, uh, these sports that we enjoy on horseback. Wow, that sounds really cool. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Same. It really does. Well, I can't wait to see the film. I'm in South Carolina, so I think I'm going to go to Buford in February. Oh, you have to go. You have to go. Yes. yes. I must. I must. And actually, I mean, Hannah and Lisanne, you guys are already kind of doing some of those promotional things with Hannah, your clinics. And Lisanne was just at the Mustang um, Magic event down in Texas. And so yes. it's um, y'all are all, all doing amazing things for for the horses so it's it's pretty special so is there anything let me ask else? you this can i i would like to ask you girls uh from the yeah. time you spend in the saddle like do you do you think this is something you'd like to do more of would you like to go on another long ride or do you think it'll just be this one i don't know it changes by day <laughs> <laughs> i mean like some days i'm like oh my gosh it'd be so much easier to just backpack like you don't have to worry about all these animals <laughs> then i'm like <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't leave my horses behind. And like, I don't know. And then like, sometimes I get this idea of like, oh, it'd be fun to go and do a long ride in New Zealand and do one in Australia and do one in Europe. But then reality is, like you said, like family, you know, time doesn't stop with them. And, you know, I do miss, you know, my family at home and, and things like that. And um, I don't know. So who knows? You know, like I said, it changes by day. Some days I'm like, oh man, I'm really going to miss this lifestyle. Like I really do want to enjoy every moment of it and I don't know if I could stop and then other times I'm like uh eh, I don't know <laughs> you know so I'm yeah, interested. yeah. <laughs> and for me I mean I grew up on a 55,000 acre cattle ranch in Wyoming and like I you know my family's heritage builds upon the back of a horse and so um unfortunately my family lost that ranch with the fluctuating interest rates in the 80s and so I feel like part of me has always been trying to get back to that livelihood of being in the saddle every day and I just didn't realize it was going to be like riding across America. Uh, um, so I feel like, I don't know if I'll do another long ride like that, but I've also like Hannah, like I've talked about doing, they call it the triple crown, essentially where, where you would do like the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide Trail. And then I'd have to hike the ADT, but I thought about doing that or maybe I just want to go up in the mountains and guide pack trips and hunting deals and just still be on the back of a horse every day. But yeah, I mean, I owe my life to these horses and I don't want, want that to change. So yeah. let me ask you another question. That's uh, hard for me. Like I, I rode most of it alone. So at some points people would come with me and although it was nice at some points it was hard having someone else out there because there's so much going on already. And then you get two people with, you know, strong uh, opinions and it's like, no, let's go this way. Let's go that way. Let's keep riding. Let's stop here. That's safe. That is not. Um, so <laughs> did you know each other prior to this? Were you friends? And what's it been like to share this uh, with each other? Has it been hard? Has it been easy? Yeah. So we've known each other for eight years now. I have to update now that oh, yeah, we've been on this for crazy. a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we've known each other for a while. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to be Hannah's guinea pig and her first student. So I went and interned under her for a couple months and lived with her then. And it's kind of like where the seed was planted a little bit, but not watered until later. And then, uh, yeah, after that deal, um, we found this mule and I've wanted a mule staying for a really long time. And Hannah really wanted a mule to train at Liberty. So we decided to co-own her. And then from there, like we really kind of set up like a partnership and like plan this long ride. And so I moved and I lived with Hannah up in Montana for, I think like six -ish months this summer. Um, nice. before we went. So like we did get to know each other, like really closely. I mean, I lived at her place for almost eight months um, accumulative by that time before departing for this ride. And a lot of times they're pretty much on the same wavelength. And then like, there definitely have been times where we're like not agreeing on a few things, but for the most part, it balances out. Like yeah. Lisanne will do things that are crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think I should do that. And then here I'm doing it. But then there's times I'm like, okay, I really should do that. And Lisanne listens. So that's good. <laughs> so she pushes like me and I help rein her back. <laughs> yeah. Checks you out. got the yin and the yang. The yin and yeah. the yang that's good. Yeah, yeah. so it, it works. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That was one thing funny about Bernice. Like you could just tell like she had her way. And like she was like, no one should do it any differently than like yeah. my way. Yeah. You know, like oh she's very yeah. 
very strict about it but then like we told her like I told her our idea and she was like that's not a real long ride like you have support like that's not <laughs> that's nothing so I was like all right but I mean we ended up like I was telling her like we we're gonna go through Washington DC like our nation's capital and she was like oh yeah I would never do that <laughs> I was like okay she's like what you're doing makes sense for you and I was like okay thanks yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she, she was very intense when I met her like I nearly like question not going anywhere I'm like oh my god I don't think I should do this anymore like she had that kind of she was she's she was a very opinionated and very strong character right and like yeah like it was an it was an intense 24 hours with Denise uh that made me question my entire life and whether I wanted to actually <laughs> go through with this insane plan but turns out my boss was leaving me for Stan Walchuk's clinic so I had no other option and then Stan was more like the complete opposite like he was very mellow and like he used to be a school teacher and like yeah man like if you want to do that that's awesome that's your way you know and there's no right way and I'm like oh thank god so it was, it was a good mixture you know like I got the intensity from her and then like the more mellow uh side of, of Stan but learned so much from her but I can totally relate I'm sure we should talk one time about our experiences because I think we, we would uh, have a lot a lot of things in common yeah. 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 Uh, I think we'll have to have episode two where y'all just chat. <laughs> and, uh, maybe every, in a couple of months, we'll see how things are looking. Uh, when, when I come out to ride, when I come out to ride, uh, we'll do another one. There yeah, you go. Perfect, perfect. That'd be great. Well, thank you for talking to us today. And thanks, girls, too. I know it's hard for you guys to get, get to a place where everybody's got power and service and all that kind of stuff, too. But it's been it's been fun for me to hear both sides of how how a long ride could be. So, so Felipe, if people wanted to follow along with you, read the book, see the film at some point, I'm guessing you're doing the festival circuit first, and then will it be available to the public? Yeah, for sure. So we're going to do the festivals first, and then in Canada, it's going to come out on uh, Super Channel and Amazon Prime in the fall. And uh, and then once we've done the festival tour, we'll we'll sell the global rights, and uh, I'll announce that when when it comes out where people will be able to watch it and uh yeah if i don't know when this podcast is coming out but if it's before february 25th any chance yeah oh that's... awesome okay so if you're in south carolina uh it would mean the world to me uh to get uh, people out for that first uh, viewing the world premiere like i said i've been working on this film for 12 years sometimes it feels like you know a century uh and yeah it'd, it'd mean the world to get horsey people out to watch it and the books are out uh, long ride home Long Ride, Stand the World. You can pick them up on uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon, yeah. And I'm writing the third run now, Last Long Ride. Uh, we'll have it out for July. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Congratulations on the project, The Long Ride. Uh, I've been following you ladies from afar, like I said, over uh, Facebook when Karen uh, sends us that message, anything you need. Um, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't hesitate to ask. I only finished my ride because of the amazing, generous, kind, individuals who help me so i know we do nothing alone so feel free to reach out and hopefully we'll come out and ride with you soon yeah thank you so much for your time it's such an honor to get to meet the legend that you already are <laughs> yeah we're <laughs> we're really excited uh to end up riding with you later later this year it'll be fun let's make it happen good luck thank you so much thank, yeah, thank you, you.